Our guest today on China Through Lines is Professor Ho Feng Hong, the Weisenfeld Professor of Political Economy and Chair of the Department of Sociology at Johns Hopkins University. Professor Hong has extensive experience connecting China's present with its past. His first book, Protest with Chinese Characteristics, Demonstrations, Riots, and Petitions in the Mid-Qing Dynasty, examines the evolution of Chinese descent in the 18th and early 19th centuries. His latest book sounds very contemporary, The China Boom, Why China Will Not Rule the World. But here again, he contextualizes his analysis on the long-term social and economic transformation of China. Today, we will discuss his latest research on how, in his view, the Sino-US relationship is better understood as an intercapitalist rivalry than a clash between authoritarianism and liberal democracy. The show notes have links to a related article of his on this topic. Professor Hong, welcome. Can you begin by explaining your argument? Hi. What does it mean to understand Sino-US relations in terms of capitalist competition rather than authoritarianism and liberal democracy? Sure, that uh, recently there's a lot of talk about uh, US-China new Cold War, uh, focusing on the difference in ideology and difference in the political system between the two countries as um, the source or the origins of the deteriorating relation between the two countries. But I just want to add uh, to this argument by emphasizing that this difference in ideology and political system have been around for a long time. Uh, in the 1980s, there might be true that many people in the US would expect China will democratize soon fully marketized soon, but uh, after 1989, after the Tiananmen crackdown in the 1990s and afterward, really nobody in, in, in the US uh, actually expect China to uh, move away from the authoritarian party state system and uh, kind of uh, reformed in, in, in the form of expanding the private sector actually started to reverse in the early 2000s when the state sector actually came back uh, to become dominant. So all these kind of ideological and political difference between the two countries is not something that is new. Uh, so we cannot really um, explain fully the, the, the deteriorating relation in terms of this ideological and political difference. So I would say that this difference is a uh, um, necessary condition, but not sufficient condition because in the 1990s onward, that is a huge uh, US cooperation interest in uh, fostering the close relation with China because uh, of the business interest, because of profitability. So they lobby uh, for policy that is favorable to China in the US and also lobby against policy in the US that is uh, hurting China's interest. So these corporate sectors are the foundation of the US-China harmony in the 1990s onward. Uh, so what changed uh, uh, after the Asian, uh, the after the global financial crisis 2008, and particularly after China's stimulus in 2009 2010, is that uh, China became and Chinese corporation and Chinese co uh, government became more aggressive in squeezing uh, foreign investors and foreign companies in China uh, and in other countries in the spheres of influence of China. So a lot of U.S. corporation. Uh, uh, are burned or they, they feel hurt uh, by this uh, situation. So they're no longer that keen in lobbying for Chinese interest in the US. So it is one important factor that the brick on the deteriorating uh, US-China relation over to a political issue and over all other kind of ideological and political issue no longer there. And then so it is why the deterioration suddenly uh, seemed to suddenly happen uh, in the recent years. So it is my, my argument that is the source uh, of the, uh, that explain the timing of this deterioration is really the, the competition between US and Chinese corporations. When you recast the recent history of China's relationship with the United States, uh, say since Nixon, what do you see in your analysis as the two or three major turning points in the relationship from your view? And how are those turning points of yours maybe a little bit different from people that would emphasize the ideological differences between China and the US? Yeah, one, one of the key turning points uh, is definitely the end of Cold War with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Because from Nixon to the collapse of the Soviet Union, what bind US and China together, there's some commercial interest, but the commercial interest is actually not that big in, in retrospect, that uh, it is the geopolitical interest, the common enemy, that is the Soviet Union, that uh, bound the two countries together 
Uh, of course, then China is not uh, directly threatening the Soviet Union, but China is very important, was very important in checking expansion of Soviet influence in Southeast Asia, for example, through uh, countering the expansion attempts of Vietnam, which is a proxy of Soviet Union. Uh, and basically China is helping the US to stem the tide of communist revolution by putting the puck on all these communist guerrilla in Malaysia, in Thailand, in the Philippines. And, um, so, so China is helping out the U.S. in, in containing the spread of communism and Soviet influence. And so it was the, the common interest uh, from Nixon to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So the first big major turning point is after the collapse of the Soviet Union, this common enemy is gone. And actually in the, in the aftermath of the Soviet Union, particularly in the first year of Clinton administration in 1993, there was uh, actually a keen, keen debate about uh, how U.S. should uh, we orient its policy toward China when the, 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 the common enemy is gone. Uh, and in the beginning, there was the human rights idealists in the Kenyan administration that really want to tie trade with human rights and use trade as a kind of a tool to uh, the push for the human rights uh, improvement in China and in, even in, in the end, some regime change kind of uh, thinking. Uh, but in the end, it's very changed rapidly because China mobilized the U.S. cooperation to lobby against the, the, the linking uh, between human rights and trade issues. And then the, the, the trade issue then was delinked from human rights and then uh, the economic interest dominates. So it is the, the first uh, really kind of uh, emergent, near emergence of a local war uh, in 1993, but because of the uh, corporate uh, lobbying that uh, in turn the corporate lobbying is very much mobilized by Beijing and they surgically target a lot of uh, key influential corporations that is not necessarily uh, connected to trade with China to, to influence the uh, US policy and, and the Congress and the White House to change the policy by uh, delinking human rights from trade. And then it is the theory of engagement that US just need to focus on trade with China. Uh, and besides that, that uh, really US doesn't really need to uh, focus on its own right, in its own right, the uh, human right issue, because if trade prosper, then China will improve its human rights. It is a theory. So these, these uh, situation continue until 2000s, uh, uh, and then the uh, global financial crisis hit, and then the uh, China stimulus, successful stimulus uh, hit, uh, then in 2009, 2010, China has a rebound. And then after that, the China the economic prosperity and economic growth, hyper growth, uh, slow down. So it is the, another turning point when the Chinese government start to squeeze U.S. corporations in China and abroad, and then the U.S. corporations uh, start to change their, uh, their attitude toward China, and is less enthusiastic in uh, lobbying on China's behalf. And then it is another turning point that uh, I see that the, the deterioration of U.S.-China relation did not start with Trump. It actually started with Obama administration, particularly second term when. Uh, Obama tried to use the TPP to exclude China and put pressure on China and also the pivot to Asia uh, to mobilize a lot more labor forces back to Asia Pacific to contain China growth. So it is really starting in the Obama administration and Trump escalated and continue it. Hmm. I'm going to shift a little bit to talk about some of the specific implications of your interpretation. What does your analysis suggest about the prospects for cooperation on specific issues such as the climate emergency and efforts towards mitigation of the climate emergency, especially if the US and China go the technology heavy approach uh, to solving this problem or attempting at least mitigation of this problem? Yes, definitely. I would see that in, in climate change in um, terms of setting up a global framework like the Paris Agreement and that kind of uh, global framework to make everybody in the world to be committed to cutting carbon emission. I see China and US uh, share a common interest in doing it. And this common interest is not about idealism and responsibility for the future generation. In the end, it has something to do with business interests. And then it is where the common ground uh, stop. And then the rivalry started even in climate change because during Obama administration that I expect will continue under Biden is that the idea is that the US should push for a global framework for everybody to cut carbon emission. At the same time, the US government should invest a lot in green technology uh, so that to make sure that US can become an exporter of this green technology to help countries around the world to cut carbon emission. So it is the idea in the Obama administration. So it is both, both a kind of a uh, solution to the climate crisis at the same time 
a solution to uh, reviving U.S. Uh, technological progress in this age of green technology. And, and in the Obama administration, we already, and China has the same interest that China want to become kind of a green technology power or exporter. So to benefit economically from this kind of a uh, uh, global fight against climate change. And it is where the US and China can get into a coalition cause in this regard, because there's some concrete case in the Obama administration. For example, there is a poster trial of green technology uh, in the, the Obama administration, that is the A, um, AMSC, it's a company in Massachusetts, American Superconductor, which is a kind of a poster trial of the Obama era. And Obama, I think, uh, visited the firm and, and praised it as a kind of a model of green technology because this firm is, um, is very successful in providing um, wind turbine uh, producers uh, the high-tech components and software that drive the wind turbine. So AMSC uh, in the Obama era is very profitable, very successful in stock price soar because uh, it got China to, be, to become its biggest customer because China is the kind of the biggest uh, producers of wind turbine for, for Chinese market and for exporting to the world. But China at that time didn't have the technology to do the high-tech components. So they need to buy the high-tech components and the software from AMSC. Uh, in the end, that uh, AMSC suddenly in, in 2010s, uh, it, its stock price collapsed. It literally went bankrupt because uh, China suddenly canceled all the order from AMSC. And then they then it is not allegation. It is all established in court now that the court case is closed. That, uh, that because the Sinovel, Sinovel, the Chinese uh, Huawei Fengdian, that is the Chinese company that created uh, to produce all the wind turbine and all make all the order from the AMSC, uh, the bribe a frustrated employee in the AMSC to, to ask him to download all the secrets to make those components. And then after the, the Chinese company, that, that company is interesting because it's very, very well tied with the Wen Zhabao family uh, and, uh, and managed to uh, get a hand of the technology and start to make the high tech component itself. So it no longer leads to AMSC and AMSC suddenly lost its biggest market. So it got into big trouble. Um, and it is the nature of the US-China uh, rivalry as driven by intercapitalist competition because the, the biggest, complained by US corporations is this intellectual property theft. Um, and in the case of AMSC, because we can say for sure, because they have the other court case and then it is already ruled that uh, the Chinese company is at fault and then the employees in behind bar now uh, for, for uh, uh, providing the Chinese company with all these trade secrets. Um, so, so it is the nature of the US China corporate competition and it is reflected in this green technology competition. China want to be a top green technology leader and then the US also want to be so. And then there's this kind of intellectual property dispute uh, that is originating from this green technology sector as in many other sectors as well. Um, well, I have to say that doesn't sound like a very optimistic answer. While, while the planet is uh, increasingly troubled, you're, it sounds like you're saying that the immediacy of, of, of economic competition, specifically over green high tech, uh, is going to lead to more squabbles uh, and potential conflict than to co collaboration. Did I understand that point correctly? Yeah, definitely. So uh, though the two countries has a common interest in fostering some kind of a global agreement, uh, like the Paris Agreement, to make sure that everybody will, will, will demand, will lead this technology, but the two countries, US and China, will at the same time compete uh, on becoming the green technology leader. And of course, this competition can be healthy, can be can be less healthy uh, if it involves uh, intellectual property theft. And, and so whether this competition will lead to a more harmonious relation or more um, acrimonious relation, it depends on fundamentally whether this technological intellectual property um, transfer and technological uh, intellectual property theft issues between the two countries solve. It is what, how, why the Obama administration wanted to set up the TPP to pressure China to change its uh, pro, uh, regime to protect intellectual property right. And it's why Trump uh, start the trade war to try to pressure China to get, get into a trade deal in which uh, China uh, could pledge to protect better the intellectual property rights. So it is in the end that nailed down to these issues of intellectual property rights. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I'm smiling just out of uh, exasperation. I mean, we, with the wildfires we had this past year, 
it seems like the alarm bells are going off, but you, it seems that those alarm bells aren't going to lead to the kind of um, cooperation necessary, or it's not going to lead to it very quickly. Um, is there any way we could look at this sort of situation and think more optimistic thoughts? For instance, that China, Shanghai is going to sink before New York does, so they have more of an interest to meet the U.S.'s demands. Um, there's there's a reason for optimism that uh, definitely that the Chinese state enterprise is very powerful, and then they are always at the receiving end of the allegation of intellectual property theft. And then, but uh, many people are optimistic that China is already having a vested interest within China to push for better protection of intellectual property rights. Uh, that is the private sectors, the private companies, that they are also victims of uh, the intellectual property theft uh, of their own, and they are very innovative. And uh, so this, this is a kind of a potential allies of the US companies and, and, and to, to foster better the, the environment and regimes and to protect intellectual property. And in the end, that uh, all developing countries and and Asia, in Asia, like uh, Japan and Taiwan, South Korea, at the earlier stage of uh, of development, they have these issues uh, with uh, developed countries. That is the intellectual property right uh, violation. And later on, of course, under U.S. pressure, they adopt a better intellectual property uh, right protection uh, apparatus. And in the end, that they find themselves also a beneficiary of this better protection because this better protection also encourage indigenous uh, innovation uh, so that actually they find that they no longer need to steal. They can actually, with a proper protection, they can innovate uh, actually better than the US. So it is the learning curve uh, of this uh, late coming uh, developer. And, and of course, China, because of the monopoly and powerful state enterprise, there's a, a, a strong interest in resisting this uh, better intellectual property protection. But, but we already see some kind of a healthy seat uh, in the economy that actually it is, uh, it, its interest also lie in uh, better protection. And in the end, that uh, probably US could uh, patiently explain to, to the Chinese government and the state enterprise if uh, that uh, China protect intellectual property better, that China in the end, just like Japan and Taiwan and South Korea earlier, they will uh, benefit by actually developing a more healthy and powerful indigenous uh, genuine uh, uh, innovation system. So there, there is some, some uh, silver lining somewhere, but not, not in the immediate term, maybe. Yeah, it sounds like we have to wait for lawyers to sort things out before we focus <laughs> on saving the planet. Oh, lawyers are very important. Uh, in, in um, uh, let me uh, shift a little, a little bit uh, mm -hmm. to talk about um, your evidence and methodology in doing this research. Sure. Um, yeah. I really appreciated that you had specific turning points, especially 1993, 94, um, yeah. In contrast to say 1989 in Tiananmen or Deng yeah. Xiaoping's Southern Tour, um, what sort of evidence um, and methodology do you use to make your argument? Yeah, the 93, 94 turning point is uh, is based on an article that I already published in the Review of International Political Economy. At that part, and I uh, find actually Chinese official media very useful uh, because uh, there is uh, people who research on the turning point in the Clinton administration between 93 and 94. In 93, Clinton declared that he will link human rights to trade, but in one year afterward, that all of Congress and White House, without any change in power, that the suddenly uh, uh, took a 180 degree turn to delink human rights from trade. Uh, so many people are puzzled and many people know that it is US corporation lobbying uh, that uh, motivate this turn, but uh, they just assume that the U.S. corporation know by instinct that their future is in China uh, without thinking further. Why this U.S. corporation, why in 93 that they don't give it a damn, and, but in 94, suddenly they lobby hard against human rights condition. So uh, I couldn't find any clue by looking at U.S. media, but when I look at the U.S. official media, basically as simple as uh, People's Daily, I find a clue because uh, uh, I find that between 90, late 93 and early 94, there's a lot of um, US corporation CEOs are being invited to China to visit and signing MOUs and all that things. And then, and then these corporations basically um, trading with China in the sense that China actually explicitly in the report, you can find it, it is openly reported in, in, in Chinese language that they are helping the, the Chinese government to lobby the US uh, government uh, to delink human rights and, and, and to make the China's most favored state, nation status 
uh, automatic uh, without, with, with, without any consideration of human rights. And then it's ex in exchange, they get all these kind of contracts and, and drilling rights and, and, and or, or, or promised it, uh, uh, access to market. Uh, so it is widely reported in the Chinese media, but not in the US media for obvious reason. Of course, the US corporation is, is a bad PR if they let the US media find that they are doing this deal with China. But in Chinese media, it's interesting that the Communist Party, right after the Soviet collapse, they are very eager to show to the people that, uh, that they are working hard to lure, lure the US corporation to help China's uh, economy grow. So it is something that the Chinese Communist Party want to brag about that we are working very hard to, to, to seek the help and assistance of a US corporation and they are helping us. Uh, so in the Chinese media that you can find this kind of uh, visit and MOUs and deal between the Chinese government and that corporation. And by based on that, I find that actually it is the Chinese government that actually mobilized the US corporation uh, to lobby uh, for this drastic change in policy in the 93 and 94. And of course, another turning point is uh, 2000, around 2010 uh, when uh, when the uh, U, uh, U.S. corporate uh, disposition to China changed to a less positive, if not outright negative tone. And on that, I, I rely a lot on the lobbying database in the U.S. because in Congress, there's uh, U.S. Congress, there's uh, Lobbying Disclosure Act in 1995. So after 1995, uh, any lobbying activities in Congress uh, is very well documented. They have a database on that, that uh, what lobbying firm and lobbying uh, Congress for what issues, what is their position on that issues and what is the corporation that hired the lobby firm. So I pull out all the lobbying records related to China policy uh, to look at what is going on and then find that uh, uh, starting from the, uh, 2008, 2009 and picking in around 2010, there's uh, peak of corporate lobbying uh, on Congress uh, regarding intellectual property rights issues and market access issues. Most of them are complaining about uh, that the Chinese government is not uh, granting us uh, sufficient and promised access to their market. So they're lobbying Congress to do something about it or they are complaining that uh, they, their intellectual property right is not protected in China. So they lobby Congress to do something to put pressure on China to uh, protect their property, intellectual property right uh, better. So I see a peak uh, around that time of this kind of a lobbying and it stayed very high ever since then with uh, slight ups and downs. Uh, so this is another turning point that is these issues of intellectual property right infringement and the US corporation complaining insufficient access to the Chinese market as promised that uh, become very prominent and then so much so that it drive the US government to change its policy on China. Yeah, that's that's very illuminating. Um, I think the first part of what you said is seems particularly important, namely the difference between uh, or what you're finding just openly said in the Chinese press. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mentioned that because it seems like people could go back and imagine this to be some sort of plot, uh, some secretive plot in the you know inner reaches of uh, Zhongnanhai or something yeah. rather than kind of openly yeah. stated we're going to play by American rules and yeah. by trade rules and entice them in exactly in this way. So yeah, that's um, very eye-opening. Um, I want to shift a little bit to talking about what seems to follow on what you just said is um, if we're looking for prospects of improving relations, what are the chances of a new U.S. lobby emerging to replace the U.S. manufacturers you focused on before and that, that might pr promote better trade relations with China? In the immediate terms, I really don't see the kind of a, uh, a new forceful actor that could emerge to have a strong interest um, or economic interest on, on, on the better US-China relation. Then of course that many people would think that the Wall Street will be the likely candidate because after all, uh, when the manufacturers, high-tech firms and um, and they get burned in China and then they get squeezed in China. They have all these intellectual property issues, but the Wall Street firm seems to be uh, the one that is still making big money uh, uh, by collaborating with the Chinese firms, uh, mostly in uh, in servicing the wealthy people and the enterprise, uh, help them financing. Uh, uh, um, uh, but there's still, still issues because uh, when China got in the WTO that they promised to open the financial sector to foreign firms, but now that is not yet very open, that foreign firm cannot like uh, run operation in China with, uh, to with total ownerships of the operation. It need to partner partner with um, 
uh, partner with a Chinese uh, financial firm. So the U.S. Uh, financial corporation is always want to lobby the U.S. government and lobby the Chinese government to open it up. And then Chinese government keeps saying that they are going to open, they are going to open, but uh, but lot a lot of things actually happen. Um, so so they are they are still pressuring. They're still not very happy with the status quo. But uh, of course, that it has Hong Kong as a kind of offshore financial center. So a lot of Chinese firm doing the IPO, the initial public offerings, and in the stock market in Hong Kong, that is Hong Kong is the biggest IPO market because so many Chinese firms are doing initial public offering, floating in the financial market, and it's a big business there. And then U.S. firms, financial firm, used to be a big player by becoming the um, the, the underwriters uh, of these IPOs, and then of course in uh, IPO you 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 charge fees on the company, and also as an underwriter of these IPO that you also subscribe to the stocks uh, of the company at a discounted rate. So when the IPO happened, usually the stock price rose, and then you can sell uh, the pre-subscribed uh, stock, and then those companies make a big um, amount of money. So Wall Street firm is very happy, but even that. Um, I have another database looking at the IPO activities in Hong Kong, and then you see the Chinese state banks is squeezing American banks out. Not totally, but uh, uh, you, uh, most of the IPO now in, in, in Hong Kong, uh, uh, the IPO of the Chinese firm is, is done by the, the Chinese state bank. Even in New York, and in, in New York Stock Exchange also, the Wall Street firm uh, has have been having a good time in doing IPO of Chinese uh, company uh, floating doing IPO in the New York Stock Exchange, but even that, that you see the rise of like Bank of China and then, and ICBC and and then all these uh, Chinese state bank is also becoming more prominent, even in uh, New York Stock Exchange. So this IPO business, uh, the, the the U.S. banks also also feel the feel the squeeze, so they have reason to be unhappy. And in the Obama administration, they are lobbying for a kind of bilateral. Uh, bilateral investment treaty with China. Uh, so it, uh, make sure that China will open up its financial market more for Wall Street firm, but it's not going anywhere. Uh, it's not likely to be revived. So even Wall Street is, is, uh, is they are happy, they are making a lot of money, but even they have some kind of serious concern about trying to open this. Uh, that, that, uh, so I don't see any immediate forceful actor that can be as uh, friendly with China as like in 94 for lobbying or going all the way to lobby on behalf of China in the US political system. Well, let me wrap up by asking you one last question. As you gaze into your database informed crystal ball, <laughs> what do you think is likely to happen? And what should we look for as the early signs that your prediction is coming true? Yeah, definitely that, um, um, my uh, prediction is that actually there's a historical component of my research that I don't have time to present the other day. That is uh, to compare with uh, the intercapitalist competition in, at the turn of the 20th century. So what I see is that the uh, U.S.-China competition is not a little cold war. It's not not anything like the Soviet Union and U.S. competition uh, in the, the, the 20th century. Or mid or, or mid or late 20th century, but it is more like the UK and Germany competition at the turn of the uh, 20th uh, at the turn of the 20th century in the late 19th and early 20th century. That uh, the two countries, the UK and Germany, used to have a lot of close commercial and even uh, social cultural ties, more more even more than the US China tie. You know that uh, a lot of UK uh, British aristocrats, even the royalty. They're German, basically. <laughs> so, uh, but then the, the, the relation turns sour when German companies and UK companies start to compete uh, for economic influence in, in Central Europe, in Eastern Europe, and even in uh, Latin America. It is fascinating. You look at uh, uh, the, in the late 19th century, German banks aggressively expand in Latin America to squeeze out uh, UK bank in lending money to Latin American countries to build railroads. So that the, the whoever borrow the German money will buy German products, German steel, and German uh, uh, train cars and things like that. So this kind of a and the same thing happened in Central Europe and Eastern Europe. And then this economic competition uh, soon escalate into geopolitical and later military uh, competition between two competing spheres of influence and lead to world war. Uh, I'm not saying that my crystal ball show this thing can lead to world war, that it can be one possibility that this intercapitalist competition historically lead to geopolitical and military competition and war. But now 
in the 21st century, there's a silver lining in the sense that uh, this uh, economic competition can turn into geopolitical competition that might not be turning into world war, but might be turning into a kind of a less malicious uh, competition over the control of, for example, multilateral institutions um, and global governing institutions like the WTO and the UN and all these kind of organizations. So this political competition between US and, and, and China uh, is kind of inevitable. Uh, I don't think it is very easy uh, for the two countries to go back to the harmony uh, of the 1990s. And, and after all, that is just like Germany in the 19th century when it was still perceived themselves to be weak and dependent. They don't want to challenge UK, but once they reach the level that they think they can challenge the UK, there's, there's no going back. So unless uh, the economy suddenly collapsed, which didn't happen and it is not going to happen to China. So the, the economic competition is not going to go away. And, uh, but uh, this inevitably will lead to political competition. Whether this political competition, geopolitical competition will be in the form of war or in the form of um, compete, competition for influence in this international organization, thanks to the Bretton Woods, thanks to the end of the second world, is all, we now have all this organization. Uh, WTO and UN and World Bank and all these multilateral organizations. So this competition can happen in those organizations. So uh, it is reflected in the WHO in the governance of pandemics uh, that China influence is expanding. US is kind of uh, at the expense of US and now US want to regain its influence in the WHO at the expense of China. So this competition can be happening in this arena. If it is the case that we, it is not exactly a, a pretty picture, picture, but it is much less malicious than World War, I think. Well, uh, that's a lot to think about. Um, Professor Hong, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for joining us and good luck finishing this book. We all look forward to reading it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.